and welcome to today's episode of the Martial Arts Studies Podcast. This episode is mainly uh, the recording of a keynote lecture given by Marjolin Van Bavel on the subject of Lucha Libre Wrestling. This was recorded at the 2022 Martial Arts Studies Research Network Conference in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, it begins with an introduction to the talk given by Dr. Daniel Jacquet. Sound quality is not always perfect when he speaks because he's moving around, um, sometimes away from the microphone. And it concludes with the question and answer session after the talk. Again, I've tried to improve the sound quality um, of audience member questions, but they're often far away from the microphone. So. If you really, really want to hear the questions, you can, you, you'll can. you have to have some good headphones, I guess. Um, but some of them are, are audible. So, um, yeah, and I also cut out a few sections where clips are played, so you, you couldn't really see or hear on this, um, in the podcast form. So, but apart from that, I'm sure you will absolutely love it. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Of the keynote speaker in this martial arts studies conference, exciting research that she's been doing. She has a PhD in history from the University College uh, in London, and she's a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of History at the University of Antwerp. Her work uh, is characterized by the continuous search for voices of women in history. Marjolaine is a member of the organizational team of the Cathedra Miguel Leon Portilla of the University of Antwerp Center for Mexican Studies, and she collaborates with the Institute of Historical Research at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She is also a board member of the Association for Gender History in the Dutch language area, and a member for the Belgium Forum for Gender History and of the University of Antwerp Gender and Sexuality Studies Network. Recently, she also won um, the article award for early career scholars from the Journal of Mexican Studies of the University of California Press for an article called Mobo Lucha Libre and Televisión. Yes. Marjolaine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um... <laughs> So uh, Lucha Libre is a quintessentially Mexican uh, form of professional uh, wrestling. And it's easily recognized as um, by its colorful masks and also its, uh, its high flying acrobatic uh, movements. Um, it's extremely popular even today in Mexico from the big arenas in the urban centers of Mexico City, Monterrey, Guadalajara with uh, the Arena Mexico today as its uh, biggest home of Lucha Libre, from those big arenas to the streets of the working class barrios in Mexico City where rings are mounted in the streets to the smaller towns and even villages throughout the Republic, Mexicans love their Lucha Libre and it's easily understandable why. And I hope for those who are not familiar, I will warm you up to it. <laughs> um, so in 2018, it was also announced as a, or made into cultural heritage or intangible cultural heritage of Mexico City. And for those who saw Lucha Libre at a later age, it's impossible to forget that first time. And for me, it was, I think in 2013 at the Arena Puebla, and it's, a, it's very impressive, right? You see the wrestlers, the excitement, the audience screaming at them, at each other, the vendors uh, balancing drinks and potato chips on their heads. Um, and for those, again, who haven't seen it yet, I have a little flavor um, bringing Lucha Libre to uh, Lausanne. Um, I hope this works. So these are some highlights. Uh, from a recent Lucha Libre event at the Arena Mexico, uh, organized by the Consejo Mundial of Lucha Libre, the CMLL, the dominant still today, uh, one of the biggest and very dominant uh, organization, which I will talk about a little bit uh, more in a minute. Um, and as I said, it's, it's the highlights, um, because obviously this is like one high flying move after the other. Usually, Lucha Libre uh, bouts start off with a round of more technical uh, llaveo or uh, wrestling uh, grips and, and, and more on the, on the mat and so forth. Um, and 
As you might have noticed as well, or you might know, uh, most Lucha Libre matches involve tag team wrestling between th trios or groups of wrestlers who um, compete against each other and take turns going into the ring. And traditionally fights are between two categories of, of wrestlers. On the one hand, the technicals, and on the other hand, the rulers. And the technicals are the good guys. They play by the rules, they display good technique, um, they also use more formal combat styles, close to Greco-Roman uh, wrestling and martial arts techniques. And they tend to use more complex and spectacular moves. On the other hand, the rudos are the bad guys. So they, they bend or break the rules and they disrespect the referee. They also tend to disrespect the audiences. So this is the interesting thing with Lucha Libre, that it's an interaction between audiences and wrestlers. Um, so while the technicals tend to have a positive relationship with the audience, where the audience helps them and cheers them on, um, and they will not say bad words uh, to the audience, the rulers very much can uh, challenge the audience as well, and the other way around. So also the audience, um, parts of the audience identify as rulers, so they actually help the bad guys in the ring, and there's a interaction in between the audience members in the arena, um, between the technicals and the rulers. So it's a lot going on. Um, matches are generally, one by pinning a opponent to the map for the count of three and matches are decided by winning two out of three calls which is known as fighting a dos de tres caídas and as you might see on this poster um, oftentimes today these lucha libre events also involve uh, women's wrestling um, bouts although usually they get the first and um, some of the first and also the less prestigious max matches that are less attended by audiences although sometimes um, there's also uh, special events where the women are the headline of the evening, where usually national championships are um, competed. And again, to give you a flavor of this, another recent um, event from CMLL of 2021 Grand Prix. So Lucha Libre is a sporting spectacle with a clear theatrical aspect. It often involves fixed endings, uh, because promoters uh, develop characters and storylines over the course of seasons and even years. And wrestlers work together to create an order of movements um, depending on one each other, on each other to uh, give a very spectacular and aesthetic show to the audiences, where they also depend on each other in order to in uh, avoid harm or injury. And injury is quite common, also serious injury or lethal injuries, especially when wrestlers work together who know each other less or uh, wrestlers who don't get along. So reflecting upon the history of Lucha Libre from a global perspective, its transnational origins are clear. The popularity of wrestling as a transnational phenomenon in the modern era was initially witnessed in the period between the 1870s and 1914 and is partially explained by its association with both an increasing cultural uh, nationalism and the cult of physical fitness, which burgeoned in the closing decades of the 19th century. Lucha Libre as we know it today, developed in the early 20th century from trans the transnational popularity of catch as catch can wrestling, stretching from the United Kingdom to Europe, to the United States and Canada, and obviously also importantly, Japan. Although originally introduced in Mexico from abroad, the genre was thoroughly Mexicanized by innovations in narratives, techniques, characters, and costumes, um, including this really famous uh, Mexican wrestling mask. And as such, uh, Lucha Libre is immersed in and speaks of Mexico's historical, social, economic, and cultural characteristics. Lucha Libre is an example of a transnational cultural product that crossed national boundaries in the process was adopted as well as adapted to fit the localized um, Mexican context. The sporting spectacle of Lucha Libre forms part of these transnational processes of shared wrestling culture and popularity, but challenges assumptions about a global homogenous wrestling culture. The year 1933 is often referred to as the birth year of Lucha Libre. On the 21st of September of 1933, the businessman Salvador Lutero Gonzalez, together with his associates Pancho Almada and Mike Corona, organized the first Lucha Libre event in the old Arena Mexico in Mexico City. And this is the start of the Empresa Mexicana de Lucha Libre, which today still lives on in the Consejo Mundial de Lucha Libre. 
So Don Lutero, who is also known as a Tsar of Lucha Libre, is credited with bringing professional wrestling from the USA to Mexico after he originally witnessed this during a visit to El Paso, Texas a few years earlier. So as a result, today, the 21st of September is celebrated annually as the day of Lucha Libre. And although important, imported from Mexico, as I said, it was thoroughly Mexicanized. Although Lucha Libre was present in Mexico before Don Lutro started his very successful business, it cannot be denied that his business uh, thoroughly institutionalized the sporting spectacle in the Mexican context and has and continues to be very influential uh, in its development and characteristics. And when it comes to women's wrestling too, Don Ludorov is um, often credited or is basically always credited with uh, organizing the first series of women's wrestling in Mexico together with his associate, the North American businessman, Frank Moser. And these series of uh, women's wrestling uh, events took place in the old arena Mexico in July of 1935. And a number of foreign luchadoras from the US, Germany and France came over from um, the USA to fight in Mexico. One of them was Natalia Vasquez from El Paso, Texas, who is often credited as the first Mexican luchadora. As a result of this monopoly that the, the, the empresa of Lutov holds, much of the history that has been written about Lucha Libre really focuses on this one company. So the history of Lucha Libre beyond the company has remained largely unwritten and forgotten. And this is especially true for women's Lucha Libre. However, I have uncovered traces that women were active in wrestling events in Mexico at least 20 years before Lutro organized the first women's wrestling events. Groups of uh, traveling artists, athletes visited Mexico uh, putting up on performances that included both wrestling and boxing. They traveled from the US to Cuba, Havana, and then through the, um, the, the, the Puerto, the, the harbor of Veracruz to Mexico City. They fought each other and also um, apparently volunteers from the audience. So they also fought men um, who were supposed to be volunteers. So, <laughs> yeah, casually. Um, and my research has also shed light on uh, women's wrestling organized by other businessmen than Lutrov in other arenas. For example, here we see the announcement of a Lucha Libre event involving the North American wrestlers Mildred Burke, Susan Paul, Doris Dean, and Mae Weston at the Palacio de Deportes in 1940. So not only were women active in wrestling way before Lutrov um, started it, um, it was also organized by other businessmen at other arenas and uh, women's wrestling also continued to flourish in other parts of the Mexican Republic when Lutero didn't um, move on from organizing wrestling by women because women's wrestling was banned from the Mexican capital. And this prohibition of women's wrestling from Mexico City provides a privileged vantage point to reflect upon the tension between the national or local the transnational and transgressional, which are very central to uh, women's lucha libre. On the 25th of June of 1954, the government newspaper El Nacional announced that the governmental office in charge of all public spectacles in Mexico City now refused to provide Lutrov with a permit to organize women's wrestling functions on the basis that it was not considered a sporting spectacle but rather presented to exploit the morbid interests of its audiences. Lucha Libre was neither the first nor the only sport that Mexico City authorities considered uh, unsuitable for women athletes. Um, on December 5th of 1946, the president uh, Manuel Avila Camacho issued a presidential decree that banned women from taking part in professional boxing in Mexico City. And it was the Mexico City Office of Public Spectacles through its Comisión de Box, the Boxing Commission, that became responsible for ensuring that no women would enter the Mexico City boxing rings. And by, by this time in the 40s, the Mexico Boxing Commission also had become uh, responsible for Lucha Libre. So it provided an institutional framework to duplicate this ban of women boxers to Lucha Libre almost a decade later. So it was this very same boxing commission that from the 1950s onwards became responsible with, in, with ensuring that no uh, lucha libre wrestlers of the female sex were active in Mexico City. 
However, no written decree, law, or rule book officially excluded women wrestlers. Um, rather, this was a ban um, in the form of an informally um, enforced veto by the authorities. One interesting side note, by the way, about these prohibitions is that um, the while the the lucha libre, well, while the boxing ban was duplicated throughout the country, so women's boxing was prohibited not only in Mexico City but throughout the country for most of the period that you can see uh, here. The lucha libre ban was not so women's wrestling was only banned from the Mexican capital while really flourishing throughout uh, the republic, and this is what I just referred to that. So Don Lufo didn't, um, for him, he was mostly based in Mexico City. Um, there were small arenas as well that he owned, but because for him, it wasn't as interesting. Um, like they, they, even though they, these women were really active throughout the country, this history is quite forgotten. Um, so this prohibition came about at a time that Lucha Libre had evolved into one of Mexico's most popular sporting spectacles. Male wrestlers like Herc um, Ramirez and El Santo were developing international heroes and visions of male identity with their images becoming multi-mediated through television, wrestling films, and print media. And I, I will argue that set against broader moral preoccupations about the growing popularity and visibility of Lucha Libre, in Mexican society, luchadoras were seen as examples of transgressive femininity, which rendered attempts to make them invisible necessary for the authorities. So what did it mean that women's wrestling was supposedly exploiting the morbid interests of its audiences? <laughs> According to the Dictionary of Mexican Spanish by El Colegio de Mexico, morbo should be understood as the taste or pleasure for the unpleasant, the abnormal, or repulsive, especially for acts of blood, death, or the sexual. And I will unpack this a little, starting with uh, the sexual. So press coverage from the early 1950s shows how women's wrestling was construed as an erotic rather than yearly sportive spectacle, which meant that for some it was an immoral uh, spectacle. For example, on the 9th of January of 1952, El Universal announced the names of the four North American women wrestlers that were employed by Lutros Empresa as the main event for the Friday function in the Arena Coliseo. Carol Cook, Cora Combs, Morris Bennett, and Lorraine Johnson were described as skilled wrestlers who, although new to the Mexican audiences, had achieved great success within the United States and other foreign countries. They were said to be very worthy successors to the North American wrestlers Mildred Burke and Mae Young, who had become very, very popular in the 1930s and from there on. However, as the newspaper stressed repeatedly, these women were not only knowledgeable about the secrets of Lucha Libre, they were also very beautiful. The author seemed to think that in describing the women's wrestling styles, it was of almost equal importance to provide the readers with an idea of the women's physical characteristics. Carol Cook was described as a 90-year-old blonde with blue eyes and Cora Combs as a redhead with great personality. So the attraction of women's Lucha Libre was presented as based on the physical attraction of the wrestlers, which I think today is still <laughs> with us. Um, on the day of the event itself, the newspaper encouraged its readers to attend by emphasizing that these women have everything but everything to please the audiences, that is beauty, personality, agility, and beautiful shapes. And to punctuate these, punctuate these claims, pin-up style pictures of Lorraine Johnson and Carol Cook um, in two-piece bathing suits and on high heels or tiptoes went along these articles. So these pinups became, I mean, we all know this, these, these poses today, right? Like the pinups, they became very, very uh, popular in the post-war US um, environment, uh, very known for these sexualized representations that also avoided, uh, avoided explicit nudity. Um, yeah. So yeah, the newspaper construed women's wrestling as an erotic rather than purely sportive performance emphasizing the wrestler's femininity and physical attributes and its attraction to a presumed male reader. However, the same newspaper also published an article by the priest and writer, Dr. Antonio Brambilla, in which he expressed in a very distinct ironic voice, his concern about women's lucha libre on television. So he writes, considering that now in the heart of the home, little boys and girls and those that have already reached the edad de la punzada can watch women's lucha libre, 
kindly offered to the viewers of Mexico by the businessman of the Arena Colise, so Dutros, for the cultivation of female modesty and respect for women. One can appreciate that the science and technology of which we are so proud have not delivered the amount of good that we had hoped for, but rather an amount of ills that under no circumstances should be allowed. Published in direct dialogue with the above mentioned articles and photographs of the foreign uh, luchadoras, Parambila took issue with their appearance within the family home through television broadcasting. Parambila too construed women's wrestling as an erotic spectacle, as, he, as revealed by his framing of adolescence as la edad de la punzada, which is a colloquial phrase that alludes to the heightened libido of a hormonal teenager. In this context, women's wrestling was construed as morboso for its perceived uh, eroticism, intertwined with broader moral preoccupations about the growing popularity and visibility of Lucha Libre within Mexican society as a result of its broadcasting, broadcasting on television. In this context, um, it was thought to negatively affect not only children, adolescents, but also adults. To social conservatives, conservatives as Brambilla, who were often associated with the Catholic Church, the fact that women wrestlers had penetrated the Mexican home through the television screen represented a threat to the Mexican family and Mexican nation. However, in the early 1950s, social preoccupation around women's wrestling was not just framed around this perceived immoral erotic potential and its effects on boys and young men. Women wrestlers were also thought to present a bad example for little girls and women. In May of 1950, El Porvenir published a cartoon by Pomponio portraying a little girl with a bow in her hair and a, her face twisted in an ugly, angry grimace, jumping up and down on her innocently smiling doll. The scene takes place in what looks like a middle-class uh, children's bedroom. A man and a woman, presumably the parents, observe the girl from the door opening with surprise and preoccupation on their faces. The cartoon's caption reads, she wants to be a wrestler when she grows up. Here, both the gender of the child and the object of her aggression are of importance. It is a, is a particular type of violence by a little girl directed to her doll and the reference to her future that are meaningful. Playing with dolls takes up a particular place within the formatting of gender, as these stories are primarily given to uh, female children to awaken their maternal instincts. The implication of the cartoon, therefore, is that rather than grow up to become a caring mother, this girl will grow up to become an aggressive wrestler. In the 1940s and 1950s, women increasingly participated in Mexico in social and public life due to processes, processes of economic modernization and political change. President Adolfo Ruiz Cortines granted women uh, in Mexico the vote in national elections in 1953. However, Authors like Marta Santillan have argued that Mexican women's access to the public sphere and political rights was tempered by strengthened discourses of redomestication. In a moment during which women's social and economic mobility was increase increasing, political elites and hegemonic intellectuals insisted in the fact that women should not look to develop themselves uh, beyond their homes. Much of the cultural understanding of what Mexican femininity represents can be understood through conceptions of Mexicanidad as connected to motherhood. The ideal Mexican woman was construed as a self-sacrificing mother. This gender type, gender stereotype of the self-abnegating mother was pitted against the violently macho man. And there was a clear understanding of what characteristics women could not or should not uh, share with men. This is masculine traits like strength, decisiveness, courage, and violence which were all ascribed and uh, naturalized in the concept of male Mexican masculinity. While aggressiveness had been construed uh, as natural for Mexican men and thus a masculine trait, women had, um, <clears throat> for women had been considered unfeminine. The image of women's aggression aroused fears of the blurring of gender lines that are experienced as natural. Thus the ban on women's wrestling can be explained by the transgressional character of women's wrestling. Not only did it represent an immoral spectacle, but it also portrayed images of femininity that were not consistent with dominant gender ideals. But I argue the timing of the band was also um, very interesting. 
For decades, the visibility of women's wrestling in Mexico had been greatly limited to foreign women who traveled to Mexico from the US uh, mainly and other um, European uh, countries. But the late 1940s and early 1950s saw the emergence of a group of pioneering Mexican women wrestlers who were becoming increasingly visible throughout the country. This group of pioneras included La Dama Enmascarada, you see her here in the picture, or the Mas Lady, Irma Gonzalez, Tonia La Tapatia, which means Tonia from Guadalajara, eh, La Enfermera del Medico Asesino, the nurse of the killer uh, medic, and Rosa Williams. Um, I was fortunate enough to do many interviews um, with Irma Gonzalez, who is the only known survivor of this group of pioneras. And through the interviews, it became clear that wrestling really was a crucial strategy of economic survival for these working class women, several of whom were single mothers and important providers for their extended families. Irma was born into a circus family who lost everything when the circus of her father burned down. And she grew up in poverty in a working class area of Mexico City. She entered Lucha Libre because of her um, cousin, La Dama en Mascarada, who um, was already active in wrestling, quite a bit older than her. And um, she used wrestling also to provide for her uh, family. She had many children. And um, she ded dedicated her, so I'm talking about La Dama en Mascarada. She started doing wrestling um, after she couldn't do her circus, she also came from a circus family. Uh, she couldn't do her circus um, performance anymore because she used to dangle from uh, an object in her mouth from the ceiling and she wasn't tiny and uh, very young anymore. So she actually took up boxing um, for a very short amount of time. Sadly, I don't know much about this yet, but I'm hoping to find out more about this. Um, and then started to, took up wrestling. But one day was one wrestler short, for an event and she saw Irma at the age of around 13 years old, more or less in like in the this left hand picture. And she said like, actually Irma, you're quite strong. Like, can you come along and uh, help us out? Which she, Irma did. And uh, it went really well for her. So she had a natural, she says a natural talent for wrestling because also she, she had a background in the circus as a contortionist. And she also loved performing. So she loved being in front of audiences and this is something that she talked about throughout all the interviews of her, about through, it was true for her whole career. She would really do it um, for the fans, you know, and the fans loved her. And at the end of her first wrestling bout, she was giving 50 pesos, which to her at the time was a fortune. And she took it home to her mother to help uh, provide for her siblings. So from the very start for her, it was something that helped her to provide for her extended family. Um, so she had a very long and very successful career stemming from the 1950s up until the 1990s. You can still find her today, um, uh, not as much anymore because she's not very, um, I mean, she's, she has difficulty walking and so forth, but um, she's still a fit. Everyone loves her still. Uh, and actually and she loves the fans still, like um, sadly because of her older age, her memory is deter deteriorating and um, she has problems remembering um, like basically daily, she is scared that she's running late for a Lucha Libre event and that she's um, going to disappoint the fans. So it happens a lot that her daughter, Irma, Consa uh, Irma Aguilar, who's also a wrestler, uh, has to say like, no mom, today we're not wrestling. Um, anyway, she's, yeah, she's amazing. So uh, she had a really long and successful career, both inside Mexico, the whole Republic, but also traveling to the United States, Japan, Germany, um, and several Central American countries. And the earnings from Lucha Libre allowed her to buy a plot of land and construct a home for herself, her daughter, her mother and other family members. So not only her daughter, but also a sister and several nieces have also been active in wrestling, although are not as famous as Las Irmas because mother and daughter Irma also start uh, wrestling together in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, um, yes. Also, what I want to say is that, interestingly, because these women traveled around the country, their sexuality was not controlled through marriage. So although Irma Mama Gonzalez um, married her, the father of her daughter and retired from wrestling for a short period of time, they soon separated and Irma returned to wrestling in less than a year's time in order to provide for her daughter and her dependent family members. Um, and she even returned to wrestling before separating. Um, 
even though her husband didn't want her to wrestle, she uh, took up a mask of El Santo and entered the ring anonymously um, as La Novia del Santo or the girlfriend of El Santo. So the fashion couldn't stop her. Um, she never remarried and had, other, had several other relationships. So Irma challenged conventional, conventional um, gender norms and some luchadoras also challenge uh, heterosexual constructs of sexuality. For example, um, Tonya La Tapatia reportedly was lesbian and she's not the only one. Also wrestlers in the, from the 1970s and 1980s, although not very openly, but are known to be lesbian women. So as a group, Lucha Libre's pioneras did not fit within constructions of proper female um, gender roles um, or um, as they contrasted with the ideal Mexican woman who was construed as self-sacrificing um, mother and wife. Um, so in doing so, they also opened up new possibilities for women, women's roles and identities. And those types of alternative examples were at the time not respectable or acceptable. So these Mexican women caused intertwined elite anxieties about gender, class, and race. In Mexico, light colored skin and eyes have long been construed as a mark of feminine beauty in a racial and racist fashion. The white foreign wrestlers met conventional standards of feminine attractiveness and their sexualized attire and feminine displays catered to the male entertainment. In that context, women's wrestling was simply one variation of the ways in which women and their bodies aroused sexual fantasies and allowed voyeurism on the part of their male audiences. Um, in contrast, Las Pioneras were mestizo working class women who displayed darker, shorter, bulky, muscular physiques, which allowed less for the reframing of their actions within feminine convention, thus making them less threatening. So making them more threatening. Moreover, according to Irma, while the American wrestlers were more preoccupied with posing in the ring, recalling these types of pinup images, the Mexican luchadoras prided themselves in showing llaveos, wrestling holds, and la verdadera libre, real wrestling. By 1952, las pioneras were also being employed by the direct competition of Butro, by the businessman Jesus Garza Hernandez, who organized functions of women's wrestling outside the capital, but also was one of the first people to start broadcasting Lucha Libre with, of men, um, which he filmed inside of Mexico City. So this really caused women wrestlers to hope to also soon, um, like the, the Mexican women wrestlers also soon uh, enter the television screens because women's Lucha Libre was visible on television, but it was mostly um, foreign women, uh, also foreign broadcasts, shown on Mexican television. So there was this moment of hope for the Mexican women that they would also um, enter the, the television screen. But the ban of women wrestling from the Mexican capital in 1954, and also the ban of Lucha Libre from Mexican television in general from in 1956, put a stop to that hope. By banning them from Mexico City, they were pushed back into the working class margins of Mexican society and made largely invisible within the country's middle class homes. So in conclusion, Lucha Libre is an example of a transnational cultural product that crossed national boundaries and in the process was adopted as well as adapted to fit the localized, localized uh, Mexican context. Women's involvement in Lucha Libre presents an especially interesting case as it allows for insights at the intersection of the transnational and the local from the vantage point of transgressive femininity. By the early 20th century, foreign women wrestlers regularly visited Mexico City until, until women's box, uh, wrestling was banned in the 1950s. The, men emerged, the ban emerged at a time when a pioneering generation of Mexican wrestlers became visibly active in the Mexican Republic, causing intertwined anxieties of gender, class, and race. These luchadoras were seen as examples of transgressive femininity, which made attempts to render them invisible necessary. While Lucha Libre became a thoroughly localized form of professional wrestler, wrestling, with male wrestlers like Huracan Ramirez and El Santo becoming national heroes and visions of Mexican male identity, women's wrestling, interestingly, seemed more acceptable as long as it was performed by foreign women. Thus, the exclusion of women's wrestling from the Mexican capital and of television screens did not be, um, not thus, um, but it did not so, the exclusion of women wrestlers from the Mexican capital and television screens did not withhold the pioneers from developing successful careers throughout the Mexican Republic, as well as abroad. 
even resulting in the appearance of, of, in women's wrestling movies in the 1960s. Mexican authorities seemed less concerned about women's wrestlers performing outside the capital in smaller arenas, which involved smaller and more marginalized audiences. Yet the luchadoras still served as powerful examples. The, the continued participation of women in Lucha Libre throughout this 20th century inspired many generation, generations of women wrestlers who would eventually demand the right to work in the country's capital. So by the late 1970s and early 1980s, we see the emergence of a movement um, to end the ban, which involved efforts by uh, luchadoras to convince the authorities that women's wrestling was indeed a sportive uh, spectacle and not just morboso. Only by understanding the marginalization of women wrestlers throughout the 20th century can we start to rectify the marginalization that they have also experienced at the hands of scholars. This allows us shed, to shed a light on the women wrestlers who are very much active in a context that tried hard to make them invisible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we now take questions? Raise your hand when you're ready. Please. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm really sorry I paid it a minute late. I'm just wondering if you could say a bit about how um, the, the narratives that they, they acted out to support professional wrestling, not just the sporting and athletic um, type of thing, it also has that strong um, narrative element. And I'm, I'm wondering how perhaps the racialization of certain wrestlers, or perhaps their status as mothers, as well as boys, did these things that sort of antagonize those, um, the, the mainstream sort of uh, stigmatization of wrestling, did they play on those at all in these kind of stories that they acted out? Uh, how did the uh, yeah, narrative structure through wrestling speak some of these things about? Mm -hmm. So I need to admit that uh, in contrast to most of you, I actually came to this topic not because of my um, huge, um, I'm not a wrestler myself, I've dabbled in boxing and a little bit of my tie, but uh, I really came to these topics for my love of women who transgress bodily and social norms. So especially talking about Lucha Libre today, I'm not a huge expert, uh, but when it comes to the narratives that were acted out in the earlier days, I feel like they really mostly um, were about the rules versus the technicals. Like it, I think it was already already such a special thing to see women's wrestling in those days. Like when you talk up to Irma Gonzalez, she always repeats like audiences would just come because women's wrestling was new. Throughout this whole time period, it continued to be new because it was so different. So I feel that the narratives that in the earlier day or um, in the period that I study, um, were dominant is, is, is yeah, I, I'm a technica, I play by the rules, I'm a good wrestler versus the ruda that um, when we don't get along, like that's the interesting thing as well, even though um, part of it is theater, the, the difficulties are, are the, it seems that they live uh, in real life, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think you made a great case for why like, aggressive femininity Clamped on that or clamped down on. I'm curious when you analyze the discourse that surrounded boxing and compare. So why why this was? I mean, is the discourse the same or are there differences? And does that explain why it was only in Mexico City versus the whole country? Yeah, I love that question. Obviously, um, so I, I in my research I look at both lucha libre and boxing and. Um, when it comes to, I mean, they're great cases to compare because they have so much in common in, in, in terms of history, like um, from the early days, it was a mix of wrestling and boxing in these very first, um, or at least the ones that I found in like um, the first decades of the 20th century. But then we also see that the 1920s and 1930s, especially when it comes to lucha as well, is there's this fascination um, for women who take up boxing and wrestling and they have this in common. And um, and I, I, I explain this in one of my articles about like Chica Moderna and the viral sport of boxing as a uh, fascination with transgressive women as an example for the modern women of the post-revolutionary -revolution Mexico. Um, so, but this is a very short amount of time that there's this idea that women should take up club sports to defend themselves, but also in the interest of the family and marriage life, because then um, women can keep their uh, husbands in check 
So in this time period, there is a, a preoccupation with divorce and a lot of the popular media um, or says or, or kind of blames women for divorce rates that they're becoming uh, too masculinized. Like in this idea of the modern woman who takes off sports, starts dressing differently, has this more androgynous beauty um, ideal, which also means that she should take off sports. So women are blamed from, for this masculinization of uh, society that causes divorce. But then the people who write about women in combat sports actually say, no, um, if women take up combat, then they can punish their husbands, which would be in the interest of marriage. And, and there's other things as well, um, arguments in favor of women in combat. But this is a very short amount of time. So we see in the late 30s, 40s, and 50s, the time that these prohibitions come up, that there is a return to more traditional uh, ideals of femininity, the body shape changes as well. So boxing and wrestling for women becomes not done. Um, even though women continue doing it until like in the 80s uh, and 90s, there is this whole debate again about wrestling and boxing, whether we should allow it, where again, the narratives are similar, but um, I guess with boxing more uh, pronounced in the sense that I think Lucha Libre was still more easily acceptable, accepted because it was more theoretical and it could be framed more as uh, a sexualized um, experience while boxing obviously transgressed uh, ideals of femininity completely in terms of violence. Um, I mean, all the throughout my research, all the sources, they find it really shocking to see blood upon a woman. I mean, these are things that we, I still sound very familiar today. Um, and then also the, the kind of narratives around boxing um, or the, like keeping women from boxing that are very um, medical uh, narratives, right? About that, again, we, we all know these, like, that it would be um, damaging to her reproductive system and, and so forth. I, see, I don't see them for Lucha Libre. So there is similarities and differences, but with Lucha Libre, it, it's much more um, pro directed towards this morboso, like that it's erotic. And you even see it in the 80s that it's not a proper um, um, example for Mexican women um, in terms of morality, while boxing is more framed around this idea that we should protect women from choosing to box. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Um, is the repertoire of movements different in women who than uh, for men? Like what do you do? How do yeah. you move? Again, um, I, I, I was actually wondering what questions I would get because I noticed that um, Coming from this as a martial uh, like artist yourself, you ask different questions, which is really interesting. Um, and me as a, someone who's just interested as a historical case. Um, so the movements I think are quite similar, um, although, yeah. I mean, women also used to train with men um, and yeah, I think they're quite similar, but we, yeah. What I, what I mean with this is not like in a technical level because this is a performative art, this is spectacle. Yeah. Anyway, um, and of course, nowadays, even if you say that there are women now in the Lucha Libre, um, they're, they're stepping up and sometimes the events where they have the same role as a man or so, um, still you could construct these um, gender role models by <laughs> the way they present, by the Yeah, the yeah. Acts. So this is why, why I'm wondering, like, when they move in the ring, do they still yeah, of have course. like a more sexualized way? Yeah. Stuff, stuff like this. Yeah. yeah, of course. Now I understand. Yeah, it's it's today is very present. So um, and it's something that some luchadores actually critique that um, today um, it's 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 better, it's more commercially viable um, to be a kind of attractive, sexually attractive luchadora. You might get more commercial. Um, coverage and so forth, and, and they play with it in the ring. And it can also represent itself in attire and so forth, which is really interesting from a historical point of view, because it, at some point, I mean, obviously in the 1950s, the argument to ban women's wrestling was that it was too sexualized. While from the 80s onwards, when women's wrestling is accepted or um, allowed again in Mexico City, we see this move towards encouraging luchadoras to sexualize themselves. And not just outside the ring, but inside the ring, which again is a kind of an interesting contrast with boxing because 
we see in, in other martial arts, like we see some uh, athletes um, sexualizing themselves. I mean, for example, La Barbie, uh, Mariana Juarez, she posts for Playboy magazine. Um, but this is, I mean, some athletes do this outside the ring, but they won't take it inside the ring. While in Lucha Libre, it's very much a, um, a game of, of being inside the ring. But they, there's all kinds of narratives that can be uh, projected in that sense. I mean, there's also the more butch, uh, women wrestler like uh, La Comandante today. Um, and uh, I mean, it's the same with men's wrestling, right? Like in, in terms of gender, there's a lot of interesting things going on with the exoticos. So the, the male wrestlers who take on this kind of camp persona and really play with this, um, with these homophobic um, tendencies, like they will in front of this really macho male wrestler, um, like try to kiss him or try to sit on him. So there's a lot of playing with gender, which makes which Libra very interesting because it does open up space to for like exploring themes that um, yeah that are part of society, but in other circumstances, especially in, in combat circumstances, might not be as welcomed. Thank you very much. Please fill the poll now. Thank you very much. Thank you.